we're about to enter the world of strange truth, a world where the line between fact and fiction is almost imperceptible. Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Hosted by James Brolin. We live in a world where the real and the unreal live side by side, where substance is disguised as illusion and the only explanations are unexplainable. Can you separate truth from fantasy? To do so, you must break through the web of your experience and open your mind to things beyond belief. This word may look like it spells false to you. A closer look shows that it can also be true. The stories you will see tonight will challenge your power to separate what is true from what is false. Each story may seem to you beyond belief, and in fact, some of them are totally fictitious, created solely for your entertainment. But others are inspired by actual events that have been documented as happening to real people. We've changed the names and certain details, and yet the basics of the story remain the same. At the end of the program, we'll tell you which stories are totally false and which ones have true written on them. Can you recall ever seeing something that wasn't really there? A movement of a curtain that looked momentarily like an intruder, a figure in the fog that turned out to be a shadow, the mirage of water on a distant stretch of highway shimmering in the heat? Mona Watson has been seeing things lately frightening things. Will her visions turn out to be reality? Or just another illusion? The world seemed to be closing in on me that spring. Things weren't going so well in my marriage. Plus, I'd lost my mom and dad within months of each other. Years ago, I'd had what everyone called a nervous breakdown. I was even hospitalized for it. I'd come back from that living hell but lately I'd been experiencing a disturbing hallucination. I only saw it when I looked into the mirror in our second floor hallway. I was terrified about my mental state and about that frightening image that I couldn't get out of my head. What I'm worried about, Dr. Hayes, is having a relapse. Mona, I really don't think that's what this is. Then why do I keep seeing that woman? Mona, you're working on a lot of stuff right now. Your mother just died and you're under a lot of stress. You're not sleeping well. But why does it only happen with that mirror? I'm scared to death. I don't want to go back into the hospital. The chances of that are so slim, Mona. Look, you're stronger than that. Well, what if we got rid of the mirror? <laughs> I'm all for that. I don't think the mirror is the problem, Mona. Now look, I want you to go home and get some sleep. Call me tomorrow. We'll talk about it some more. That night, I did everything I could to delay going up to bed. I knew the doctor was right. I had to conquer my own fears by myself. But I just didn't want to pass that mirror again, so I rearranged the things in the house because I couldn't rearrange the thoughts in my head. Mona. I thought you said you were coming to I'm bed. coming right now. George was already in bed. My fear of the mirror was doing nothing to solve the very real problems we had in our relationship. Yet deep down, I felt we still loved each other, and I wanted to be a strong partner for him. But I felt myself losing him and my mind at the same time. You forgot to turn out the hall light. Do you want me to do it? No. Get it. I knew that George was trying to force me to confront my demons. He just didn't know how real they were to me.
the bad weather continued all month long. And then a major storm hit that was stranding commuters like George in the city. Hello? Oh, George, hi. Uh-huh. Well, then when are you gonna be home? Can't you come home tonight? Wait, are you sure? Oh, George, please try. No. I'll be fine. Yeah. I'll just sleep with the lights on. Mm -hmm. I love you too. I was trembling inside, but I was determined to hold on to my sanity. I don't know why I didn't just sleep downstairs that night. I guess I didn't want George to come home and find me there. On the way upstairs, I made up my mind. I would compromise. I didn't care what Dr. Hayes might think. I was home alone, and I was going to do something to calm my fears. I've replayed that night's events over and over in my head, and it's as real to me now as it was on that terrible evening. I didn't know who he was, but I knew he had seen the lady in the mirror too, and that's what saved my life. The prowler was picked up a few blocks away by the police, talking incoherently about the woman in the mirror. When his record sheet was checked, it was found that in the last year he had escaped from the police after murdering a woman. Well, they printed the picture of the murdered woman in the local paper. Mona saw it and recognized it as the same woman she had been seeing in the mirror. After that day, she never saw the image again. Is this story inspired by actual events or merely smoke and mirrors? Fact or fiction? We'll find out at the conclusion of tonight's show. Next, a condemned man faces his last moments in a tale that's beyond belief. How many of us take our comfort for granted? To be seated in a warm, safe place as you are right now is something we never give a second thought. But what if the circumstances turned our world upside down? What if we were accused of a crime for which we had no alibi? Then would our comfortable seat feel quite as safe and secure? The electric chair is a relatively simple contraption composed of little more than wood, leather straps, and electrical wiring. Yet it's one of the most reliable execution devices of modern times, as gruesome as it is effective. All right, buddy. It's time. Hang in there. Be brave, Kate. Be brave. 
Even the most hardened criminal can't escape the fear of knowing he's about to die. The man behind bars would be next to take that long, lonely walk. But for now, another man had an appointment to keep. An appointment booked by a judge and jury. The straps are to keep the body down to receive the powerful charge. The blindfold goes back to the days of the firing squad. For electrocutions, it also holds the eyes in place. The final touch, and now all that remains is the lever. Time. Within days, it would be time for this man to take his seat in the death chamber. Raymond Michael Edmonston, convicted of first-degree murder. It was attorney Lee Calvin's first case as public defender. He believed in the innocence of his client, but he couldn't convince the state. Ray Edmonston's execution was drawing closer. There was a meal and then a walk back to his solitary cell, where he would have time to think about the circumstances that brought him to this point and how much different his future might have been. A future that right now had only a few hours left. I'm sorry, Ray. I did my best. It's okay. You did what you could do. Okay, Ray, back to the cell. Two eyewitnesses had identified Ray as the man they saw gun down the owner of the convenience store. There was no physical evidence. The weapon used to commit the murder was never found. Ray had no alibi. Calvin had no defense. Time, Ray. Ray Michael Edmonston was a Vietnam vet, drafted out of school. After he came back to the States, he lived on the streets, one of the thousands of homeless. For months after his arrest, he had proclaimed his innocence. Then gradually he started to realize nobody was listening. Now the only emotion he had left was the one he was trying to hide, fear. Test! He's ready. Time. Check it. All right. Again. Take it back to his cell. What his lawyer couldn't do had been accomplished by fate. Edmonston was granted a 24-hour reprieve. Prison officials worked all night and found no electrical defect. It's time, Ray. At the exact same moment the execution failed, another crime was taking place. In the city where Ray had been arrested, a gunman was caught holding up a liquor store. Detectives called to the scene of the robbery were the same ones who had investigated Ray's case. They were startled by the resemblance of the robbery suspect to Ray. 
Even before the ballistic tests were completed, the gunman confessed to the murder for which Ray had spent more than six years behind bars. Two days before his 50th birthday, Ray was free, free to make something of his life at last. Could this story be true? Could an electrical system that was working flawlessly suddenly fail at the moment of execution? Twice? And consider the fact that Ray Edmonston was innocent. Because of that, some might consider the power failure to be divine intervention. Or is the explanation as simple as those mornings when your car engine won't turn over for several times, and then suddenly kicks right in? Or that bulb in your house that only goes on when it wants to? Is this story true or false? We'll tell you in the final moments of our show. Next, a family reunion with a surprise twist. Those born with the talent to entertain others often find their lives to be a series of trade-offs. The next story is about such a woman. The road offers her acclaim for her singing every night, but it also keeps her away from her family far too many nights a year, so it's very important to keep her family together, no matter how far away she is. When I fall in love It will be forever Or I'll never fall in love In a restless world like this is love has ended before it's begun and too many like this yes cow interview on the 29th should be no problem let me just check the calendar that's me behind the desk i'm in charge of vicky sawyer's career I'm also her husband. Vicky spends weeks at a time on the road, which means our daughter, Molly, and I are left alone a lot. It isn't always smooth going for the two of us, but since I started to let Molly help out, things are a lot better. I got it here. 29th looks perfect. Now let me just check it out with Vicky once she gets to Jacksonville. All right. Talk with you then. Thanks, Paul. So how would you like to keep Mom company in New York? Cool. Can we stay at the Ritz? Why not? Could you take these to the post office for me? Sure, it's the least I could do since you're letting us stay at the Ritz. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, Vicky. Oh, boy, the connection's so bad I can hardly hear you. Oh, I love you too, hon. What's going on? You're kidding. It's 11.15, you should be in Jacksonville by now. Sure, I can meet you. Where? <laughs> sure, huh? Yeah, love you. The place where Vicky wants me to meet her is a sentimental one for both of us. A lot of what we are today started out as a handful of dreams in our little neighborhood club. I haven't been here in years, but it's close to the airport. A perfect spot for a quick get-together between planes. Vicky's always full of surprises, and she did say she has a special gift for me. That's funny. The place looks like it's closed, but I can't be. Hmm. That's strange. Wonder what that gift's all about. And she's probably gonna come out of some dark corner and surprise me any minute. Vicky? Vicky. Our table. The one where Vicky and I would sit for hours, making plans for the future. Two kids who didn't know the odds against her becoming a star and didn't care.
Vicky? Dad? What are you doing here? I got this call from Mom. She said to meet up with you guys here. Did she say anything about her flight being canceled? Well, I asked her what the deal was. I don't think she heard me. She just said meet you. I've been here since I was a kid. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, I don't even remember why we used to come here. I mean, was the food that good? <laughs> no, it wasn't the food. This is where Mom and I had our first date. It was in high school. She always liked coming back here. It's where we fell in love. How'd you know you were in love? It was how I felt the first time she touched my hand. I wanted to be with her all the time, and I, I miss her when she's not with me. Like now? Yeah, like now. It never bothers you that Mom's the one that gets all the attention? Yeah. Really? Hey, your mom's the talented one, and she'd be the first to tell you that we've all helped and sacrificed for her success. You never get jealous? You read her fan mail, you go to her concerts, you see how those guys look at her? Yeah, yeah. It, it bothered me at first, but, uh, hey, we're way past that now. I trust your mom and she trusts me. <laughs> Do you remember how you used to always let me pick up the songs in the jukebox that was over there? Oh, yeah. Once you started dancing, we could never get you to come back to the table. <laughs> I remember? I remember you, me, and Mom all dancing together. God, that's so great. I want my kids to have those kind of experiences. They will, sweetheart. Well, I remember the night your mom gave you one of the earrings she was wearing. <laughs> yeah. And she said, together they make a pair. So as long as we both had them, we'd always be together. Yes, Cal. Oh, I can't hear you. Hold on a second. Yeah, who is this? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. What's up, man? Well, what kind of accident? Oh, is Vicky okay? Just tell me what happened. Oh, my God. Dad? Over on the stage. It's the same earring, I swear it is. What's wrong? Mom called me at 11.15. I know I looked at my watch. What time was it when she called you? Um, I just got back from the post office, so it had to be before 11.30. That's when I left for here. Why would. Who called? It was Bill Morgan from Jacksonville. Said the plane with your mom and the fellas in the band crashed coming into Jacksonville at 10.30 this morning. That, that, that can't be. There must be some kind of mistake because uh, it will be we both talked to her after 11 and so Be okay, right? They're all dead. And the moment <laughs> I can feel so that was the gift, bringing us all together one last time. She's gone, baby. Is <laughs> when I fall. Both Molly and Cal received their phone calls after the fatal plane crash took place. Could they both have been mistaken about the time? And how do you explain the earring that turned up on the nightclub floor? 
Was it another earring? Someone else had lost? Or one last souvenir sent by Vicky to her daughter from the road? Or maybe this story never really happened at all. Was this story real? We'll find out at the end of our show. Next, a tale of lust and revenge on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. A gun. How many stories of fact and fiction are based on its power to change the course of human events? Yet the greatest storyteller of them all, Shakespeare, seemed to do fine without it. And although Shakespeare wasn't above the use of violence, he always made sure his tragedies had plenty of fate and irony, too. In our next story, fate and irony play a major role. But with apologies to the Bard of Avon, we could not have told it without a gun. You could always find Sharon at her computer, even during lunch break. She was my boss, but we were like sisters. And there was nothing we wouldn't do for each other. Are you still here? Oh, I, I just wanted to finish the offer on the Chasen property. Oh, come on. Everyone else has already gone to the Valentine's Day party. I'm just going to be a couple or so. Don't it. give me that. You have an anniversary to celebrate. What'd you end up getting him anyway? Tickets. Are you serious? Where are you going? Paris. We're finally going on our honeymoon. Boy, John is going to be surprised. <laughs> Sharon. Sharon must have known something was wrong when she saw the car in the driveway. It wasn't supposed to be part of the picture. She probably should have never gone inside, but she couldn't help herself, even with that police car staring her in the face. Honey? John? Sharon's husband, John, was a cop. He trained other cops. And he was well-liked. What's wrong? I thought I heard something. Oh, my God. You think it's your wife? No, no. She, she never gets home before six. Then where were we? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I heard something. I, I... No, I want you out now. Sharon, put down the gun. How could you do this, John? Sharon. It's our anniversary. Put the gun down. Freeze. Sharon, just give me the gun. Sharon. Just give me the gun. Sharon. When the gun went off, Sharon never had a chance. They said that she died within minutes. To lose a best friend so young is always a devastating blow, but... 
In this case, it seemed so absolutely unfair. The authorities cleared John of any wrongdoing and declared the case closed. But the story doesn't end there. Everyone was sure that John got away with murder. But then one day, somebody paid John a visit. Somebody filled with hate and revenge. As John worked alone in his yard, he was the perfect target. But that day, fate stepped in and took over. In my heart, I knew that one killing never justifies another one. Thankfully, the shot missed. John never even heard it. John and his lover eventually got married. She never liked Sharon's tree, so she asked John to cut it down. I guess it reminded her too much of Sharon and that terrible day. First, it seemed like a heart attack, until the blood appeared. The chainsaw blade had somehow struck the bullet and shot it straight into John's heart. Okay. Let's go. I guess fate has a funny way of evening things out. Could a bullet shot into a tree be dislodged years later to find its original target? Unexploded landmines first set in World War II have gone off decades later. And of course, a bullet in our story had been already fired once. Could the chainsaw blade have turned it into a deadly projectile again? Or maybe this is simply a fable, and our writing staff is guilty of firing blanks. The truth about this story will be revealed in our final act. Next, an eerie tale of a house and a haunting dream on Beyond Belief. Fact or fiction? For most of us, the purchase of a home is the most important investment we'll ever make. It's a transaction that includes much more than money. It also ties in our emotions, our hopes, and our dreams. Alicia Adams wasn't just seeking a house. She was searching for something more, the fulfillment of a haunting dream. It was one of those days that don't come around very often. The air was crisp and clean. The sun was warm without being too hot. The smell of freshly cut grass mixed with the fragrance of flowers and the beautiful house completed the picture. It felt like the first day of spring and the start of Indian summer rolled into one. There was absolutely nothing wrong with this ideal scene, except for one thing. It was only a dream. All right, up and at him, kiddo. We got a lot of houses to look at today. I found the perfect house. I had a dream about it last night. It was beautiful, Daniel. Two stories, a huge yard, wonderful trees. It could only be your dream house. We're looking for a starter home, remember? Mm. Hey, Alicia, come on. Honey, let me guess. No curb appeal? You didn't like the backyard? It was fine. Oh, what then? The, the kitchen's too small. The bedroom? The house is fine, Daniel. It's just not. It's not the dream house. Come on, Alicia. The dream house is a figment of your imagination. <sighs> That night was like every other night. I dreamed about the house again. And, and as always, it was a lovely, beautiful dream. The home was so inviting. I was drawn inside. 
everything was just the way I wanted it to be. As my mind traveled from room to room, I knew that this was a house I could turn into a loving, wonderful home. And I knew that somehow, some way, this house would be my house. Alicia, hey, you okay? You're talking in your sleep. Oh, I, I had another dream about the house. This time I went inside. Oh, it was so beautiful. Hardwood floors, French doors opening onto a garden. It's perfect for us. Just the place we are meant to have. It's ideal for raising a family. And someday we'll buy one just like it. But for now, let's focus on a place we can afford, okay? Hey, okay? I gotta get to work. I love you. Bye. One more house in our range. It's on Glencoe. Didn't we look in that neighborhood last week? Yeah, but it's a new listing. I am sure it's not your dream house, though, so don't get your hopes up. You can make light of it. But I can't believe I'd be dreaming about the same place night after night if there weren't a reason. I can't believe we've spent a month past Daniel, stop! House of... Stop! That, that's it. That's the house I've been dreaming about. I can't believe it. Honey? Oh, the garage. <laughs> Hurry, Daniel. It's beautiful. Oh gosh. Hold on, Alicia. You can't do this. It's not our home. Daniel. Alicia, wait. Could not barge into someone's home. The floors, the woodwork, it's all here. Even the French doors. Beautiful. Let me show you the kitchen. Sweetheart, wait. Wait, slow down. Oh, look at all these storage. It's perfect. Honey. Oh, The Biltons. Easy. The, the Cooking Island. Remember, I told you about this. Oh, this oven. The picture window. Can I help you, folks? I'm Margaret. I'm the agent representing this property. Oh, Daniel Alden, my wife, Alicia. Hi. Hi. Sorry, we're house hunting. Well, you're in luck. This place is going on the market today. Oh, Daniel. Like me to show you around? You're gonna love the backyard. It's got a pool. You've always wanted a pool, Daniel. Wait till you see the view. Your wife, she's been here before. Even though we knew it was out of our range, I insisted that we put in a bid. Daniel was sure we didn't have a chance, but my heart was beating so loud I could hear it. Honey, would you relax? You're making me nervous. I want this house, Daniel. It's perfect. Come on, you gotta believe me now. What can I say? And it is very beautiful. I mean, there's no way they're gonna accept our bid. It's way, way too low. Wow. Looks like you've bought yourself a house. <laughs> Daniel! But I, I don't understand. The house is worth a lot. A lot more, I know. What can I say? The owner instructed me to take the first offer, period. Wait. Oh, there's nothing wrong with the house. Nothing structurally. It's just... Well, the owners are convinced that the place is haunted. I don't care what the owners think. We're taking this house, <laughs> period. Oh, Mrs. Symes, I'd like you to meet the young couple who bought your home. <laughs> it's you. You're the ghost. You're the one haunting this house. We're here every night. I was here every night, but that was only in my dreams, wasn't it? Did Alicia have an out-of-body experience? Obviously, the owner of the dream house was under stress. 
She had been experiencing abnormal activities in her home. She claimed to have seen the image of a woman roaming her property. And when she saw Alicia, she immediately connected her as that woman. That could have been her mind playing tricks on her, but the question remains, how could Alicia know every detail of the house without having been there before? Unless, of course, we made the whole thing up. Next, we'll find out which stories are inspired by actual events and which are fabrications on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Let's look back on tonight's stories and see how good we are at separating fact from fiction. Remember, some stories are inspired by actual events and others are completely fictitious. Have we been able to fool you tonight? Let's find out. Our first story was about the woman who was haunted by the apparition in the mirror. Did this seem like something that you might have read about in the papers? Well, you might have. The events took place. And what about the condemned man who was saved from certain death by an electric chair that wouldn't work? Time. Did this story seem impossible to you? Congratulations. It's total fiction. Vicky? Then there was the story of the family brought together by a message that may have come from the other side. What's up, man? What kind of accident? Oh, uh, is Vicky okay? Just tell me what happened. Did this story seem to be real? Did you think it was based on truth? Not this time. It's fiction. And how about our tale of the wronged wife? the philandering husband, and the avenging bullet. Did you think this story was false? You're absolutely wrong. The bullet did find its mark. Our final plot told of the couple who were searching for their dream house and found something totally unexpected. Oh, Mrs. Sines, I'd like you to meet the young couple who bought your homes. <gasps> it's you. You're the ghost. Do you think that you've got this one figured out? Did the events take place? Yes, they did. So how did you do at separating the real from the unreal tonight? Three of our stories were inspired by actual events, and two were complete works of fiction. We hope you found tonight's stories both entertaining and thought-provoking. And the next time you sense something is an absolute lie, at least take a moment to consider it might just be strange truth. Good night. Join us next time on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. This is Don LaFontaine.